Meredith Lanier, first of all, welcome to Australia. You, you, you look fantastic. Ah, oh, well, thank you. Nice to be here. You feel and good? I, I just put on lots of makeup because I knew I was coming <laughs> to see you. But you feel great? Yeah, I do. I do. I feel really good. Well, tell me, uh, you look like you could still be riding out there at a pretty high level. No, I still race with the men in France just because I like to get them pissed off when they see a chick in front of them. That always gets, makes my day. And um, Sunday, I was fortunate enough to ride Amy's ride on the Great Ocean Road, up the ocean road with gorgeous surfers on my left and the eucalyptus on my right, and then rode up some big hill and just awesome. Really good day. Well, you are here for good reason. Tell us what I'm it's all about. I'm here for www.rideforepilepsy.com.au. So that's going to happen on Sunday, September 25th. Um, 8 a.m. You can come out as an individual or with a team. We're going to ride for six hours. And you, my friend, are going to come out and ride your bike with me, or I'll hunt you down and make sure you get there. And the people who have the most kilometers, either team or individual, at the end of the day win a prize. And the whole objective of this ride is to raise awareness on epilepsy, perhaps get a little money going for research. Epilepsy Victoria, the Epilepsy Foundation of Victoria is behind it, as is UCB, as is John Trevorrow and cycling events. So it's a huge community effort. The reason why you are attached to the Epilepsy Foundation is because you have epilepsy. Yes, when I was 22, for one some unknown reason, out of the blue, I had a grand mal seizure. My driver's license was taken away for a year, so to get around, I started riding my bike, and one thing led to another, and there I was on the World Championship team. Well, I was a candidate for the World Championship team in the U.S., and they denied me a spot because they said having epilepsy would make me a risk. But because my family is French, I have dual citizenship, so I came to France to start racing and they asked me if I'd ride for them on their national team and I said, okay, but I have epilepsy, so if it's a problem for you, it's not for me and I'm sure together we can overcome that. So in 1991, for the first time ever, and the, the French women's national team won the team time trial, one title that Longo never has, never had, never will have because the event doesn't exist anymore. And, and it was a phenomenal uh, way to start my long uh, tenure with the French national team. Are you disappointed that the US Federation turned its back on you at a time when you probably needed it most? No, it only made me stronger and having epilepsy made me push myself harder. What was disappointing in a way was that they didn't learn from it. They took someone else on and the girl who replaced me dropped off the pace at Worlds and they found out afterwards that she had MS. And it was unfortunate because she was a really strong rider and she deserved her spot as much as I did. Um, and I don't think they've really learned from that since. They still kind of make those mistakes. But that's, you know, part of the game. You speak with an American accent. You were born in the USA. You represented France. Chicago. <laughs> you have French parents, like you say. Yes. Do you feel more American than French or vice versa? I feel Aussie. <laughs> <laughs> I feel Kiwi. Now, I, you know, I just, I'm a mutt. I think I'm a mutt. I mean, the world is my home, and I, I feel good in some places. I feel bad in others. Um, I'm definitely Anglo before I am anything else. Um, uh, I really enjoy being here. I feel at home here. I like the sense of humor. Um, there are places in America where I feel at home. There are places where I don't. And there's pe places in France where I feel better than others. So, I, you know, it's, it's all about the atmosphere, the ambiance, I guess. What I'm trying to say is when you, uh, when you won all those world championships, six of them, you won the silver medal at the Atlanta Olympic Games, did you feel French? Was it, was it a right feeling when you stood on the podium there in the Bleu Blanc Rouge? Yeah. It was, but you know, I guess having grown up and singing I Pledge Allegiance or whatever to the flag every day when I was a kid to the American flag, it, I mean, the American flag is still in my heart one of the prettiest flags. I mean, that's just because it was ingrained in me as a child. And But it's not about a flag. It's about the, the effort you put into it, all the people who supported me, who helped me get through the epilepsy, the neurologist I worked with to find a treatment that was right for me that would allow me to train the guys I trained with, um, my parents who put up with my raging mood swings as I was getting ready for the games. So it's more about that than it is about a country. And, uh, you know, it's, um, I felt good for other people who had epilepsy too, just to let them know that it can be done. Let's change the subject a little bit. Your thoughts on the state of women's cycling as it stands today. Is it lagging behind the men? It's lagging behind the men in terms of financial support, although there is probably a higher level today than there ever has been in women's cycling. HTC Columbia stopped their men's team, but as far as I know, they are continuing the women's team. And with riders like Judith Arndt and Ina Tutenberg, you can't go wrong. Then you've got young Marianne Voss from Holland, who is just raging through the peloton, whether it be in cyclocross time trials or the road race. Today is the women's time trial at the World Championships, so it'll be phenomenal to see who wins that. Um, it's unfortunate that the teams like uh, BMC, Radio Shack, etc., etc., don't have a women's section as well. It would do them good because 
they need to reach out to that market, to the women's market, and there's a huge market to build there. There's just so much to do. So it is lagging financially. It's lag lagging in media. Uh, there needs to be more coverage. Um, How do we change all that? Or can, you, it, you, can it be changed? You, you've got to get out there and film it. We Nate, do our very best. You've got to get over to Denmark right now and film the World Championships. We are over there and we're, okay. we, are, we do show the World Championships Good. and we do our very best to promote world cycling yeah. at a female level. And but Australia has some of the best women in the world. I mean, they've got a fantastic team, road and track. So, so the question is, will it ever be changed? Yes, I believe it will. I just think there needs to be a little bit of a... The, com the secret combination of the good old boys club has to be broken and onward from there. I mean, I think the UCI needs to open up itself a little bit more to allow things, uh, just, you know, to do something about the TV coverage, as does ASO, the organization of the Tour de France. I mean, explain to me how is it that France organizes the biggest bike race in the world and it's the only country that doesn't have a professional women's team. That's shocking. So, you know, I've been trying to change that for years, so maybe I'll try a different tactic. Well, there was a women's tour de France for many years. Never a real one. No. You know, it was always sort of second tier and the prize money was shocking. Where is the future of women's cycling? Is it on the road or should it stay in the velodrome? Where there might Both. be more success? Both. There'd be as much success on the road as there would on the velodrome. I mean, women are more endurant than men. That's always been proven. And women can ride just as well. I mean, there's... There are some amazing women riding at the front of the pelotons, whether it be this past Sunday or at the Etape du Tour. I mean, no, it's it's a fantastic uh, event in both sides, BMX Ma as well. Marion, tell us about doping. We hear of the cases on the men's circuit, but you don't hear of too many women being tested positive for doping. Tell yeah, me. I don't think many women dabble with drugs or dare to. I know there are some. I mean, I've seen some women with sideburns. It's always a bit shocking. <laughs> but, you know, it's... Um, yeah, you don't hear about it much because it doesn't exist as much. There are some cases pending right now. There are some names out there, but but I'm here to talk about rideforepilepsy.com.au. <laughs> and I'm here to help so, you, but I want to yeah. ask you no, about yeah. one person. You may or may not answer this question, but what, what are your thoughts on Ginny Longo? Um, well, she won't be at Worlds. So that's that. I mean, that says a lot right there. There's a reason for it. and. You know, I have a little, there's a French saying, uh, la route tourne, that means the wheel turns. And I just hope it turns around to this time and that it rolls its way on down the road. Well, you told me before the cameras were rolling that you don't like to talk about Longo. You don't want to give her publicity. any free publicity. Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, I think we need to move on. There's a lot of young women in France. We've got Julie Brissette, who just won the World Mountain Bike Championships. Uh, Pauline ferrand provo who took third and who's junior world road and mountain bike champion. Those are the next generations to come. And, you know, I haven't seen uh, Jeannie turn back and reach her hand out to these young girls to bring them forward. So just let them move forward. You know, London is a fairly flat course. It'll come down to a sprint. As, long, as far as I know, Jeannie doesn't sprint. So, you know, why bother? As far as her case, I don't have any comment. I don't have the knowledge to comment on it. And I'm not here for that. You know, I'd, I'd much rather talk about the real positive aspect of women's cycling, which is, damn, these women are in shape and they're going fast. Two more questions. Do you still suffer from epilepsy? I do. I still have maybe one to three seizures a year. Um, my epilepsy isn't 100% controlled, but, you know, I ra raced 120 kilometers on Sunday with the men. I still enjoy a good glass of Shiraz while I'm here, so it doesn't stop me from, <laughs> from living 100%. And secondly, uh, women's cycling, it is in good hands. It has a future, a good future. If it's in good hands, I don't know. I mean, I'm not really sure. I think perhaps at the UCI they need a separate director, uh, possibly an, a former elite woman racer who really knows what it's all about, knows where it's been, knows where it can go, knows the potential it has. Somebody who really is passionate about it and who wants to see it reach its top. And I think that's probably what's lacking right now. So do you think the UCI is a boys club? It is a boys club. In a lot of places. That doesn't cater for women? It doesn't seem to. I mean, do you see advertisements using women cyclists? Do you see as much? I mean, you've followed cycling for years. I mean, what's your take on it? Can we turn the interview around? Can well, I interview you? I totally you, agree Mr. with Tumbrella? you. Yeah, Everything so, you've said so far, I agree with you. Television yeah, I mean, is a major problem. Media it is, is a major media problem. Media is a major problem, and that also comes from the people who are backing the sport. They don't do enough to promote their sport. If the women's tour were associated with the men's tour, that would would be so much easier for us because the spectators are all there, the cameras are there, everyone's there. And I mean, damn, the women race hard today. I mean, there's a really good race going on. The Giro was fantastic. So 
let's bring it on. Well, Miriam Cligny, welcome to Australia, and good Thank to you. know that you like our sense of humour. Thanks. <laughs>